So this is what we're going to do now here is we're going to have two 20-minute uh, uh, talks, uh, and then we'll have the questions and answers uh, at the end of the of, of both talks. Uh, and uh, we're joined. We've got this uh, Eric Chechen Chechen, who's involved in both uh, projects as well, who will join the discussion. So, um, uh, I'll, so I'd like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Shu Shi from uh, the University of Michigan, who's going to give the um, first presentation, uh, and. It, she um, will share her screen, I think, soon. And um, if you have questions uh, as you go along, uh, do feel uh, type type any questions into the question and answer um, box, um, and then we can we'll ask we can ask those at the end. So you can put them into the box as we go along, but you won't get answers until the end. Uh, right. Thanks very much. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for your introduction, George. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about our recent work on negative control variable and proximal causal learning. So I will be giving a 20 minutes talk on negative control uh, methods. And then Dr. Wang Miao will talk about proximal causal learning. And then uh, Eric Chekin Chekin um, will join, uh, Dr. Eric Chekin Chekin will join the discussion after that. Um, so this is joint work of a lot of people and the main drivers are Dr. Wang, uh, Wang Miao and Ch Dr. Chekin Chekin. And I was also lucky enough to got, get into the field uh, when I was a postdoc student of uh, Eric Chekin Chekin. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll get started. So I'll talk about negative control. First, let me give you a little bit background in causal inference, mainly just to uh, introduce some notation. So we use letter A to denote the treatment, letter Y to denote outcome, and letter X to denote the measured confounders, the covariates, for example, age, gender, race, and other measured confounders. In causal inference, the most commonly seen estimate is the average treatment effect, uh, average treatment effect, ATE, which is the mean difference between the pair of uh, potential, potential outcomes denoted as Y1 and Y0. And as we know, because we don't get to observe both the pair, the pair of both values for each individual, we need to often make some assumption in order, to, in order to identify the causal effect. And one of the key identification assumption that's most commonly made is the no unmeasured confounding assumption. So the idea is that we assume that X includes all confounders and they're all measured. In that case, we fall into the quote unquote randomized scenario in causal inference in the sense that if we look within each stratum of the population where everybody have the same value of X, then it's almost like we have a randomized trial within each of the stratum and we can fairly compare uh, the treatment and control arm. However, this assumption is not empirically verifiable. And one of the main concern in observational study is that the association found in observational data are, does not in, imply causation. And the key reason is the concern of unmeasured confounder. For example, there might be unmeasured confounding due to health status or health seeking behavior that we didn't get to fully measure. And in this case, um, there might be bias due to confounding. And um, in the past, uh, 40, 50 years, the most commonly used method is the instrumental variable. Um, however, instrumental variables often require randomization. Recently, a new type of variable has gained increasing popularity, which is the negative control variable. And we will spend some time to talk about the definition of negative control variable and uh, how people have been using it to detect confounding bias and adjust for unmeasured confounding. So hereafter, in order to simplify notation, we're going to suppress the um, measured confounder X and use letter U to denote the unmeasured confounding. So all the arguments we make are implic implicitly conditioned on X. Okay, so in order to uh, give you some uh, definition of negative control, I'm going to use two examples. Here's the first example. Suppose we want to study the causal effect of mother stress on baby's birth weight. And let's say we designed a observational study and we listed, we measured a long list of covariates that we think might be potential confounders. And we have our statistical analysis plan ready. However, we're still concerned that there might be some unmeasured confounding going on. There might be some variables that we missed 
So what can we do in this case to validate the result of this study? Well, one particular idea is to look at father stress in this field. The idea is the following. Because during pregnancy, it was the mother who carries the baby and physiologically impact baby's uh, development. We know that when, if we were to adjust for father, mother stress, it's impossible for father stress to have a direct impact or a causal effect on baby's birth weight. So if we run exactly the same analysis that we planned, but instead of looking at the effect of mother stress, we look at effect of father stress and make sure we adjust for mother stress in order to block any potential indirect pathway, then what do we expect to see in that repeated analysis running uh, and an analyzing father stress? We expect to see something like zero or insignificant effect, right? Because there's no possible pathway after we adjust for all major confounders if we fully adjust for those and also block mother's stress. Now, if we don't see such uh, insignificant effect, if we do detect some significant association between father's stress and baby's birth weight, then that indicates hidden bias. Maybe there is some un unmeasured confounder that created spurious association between father's stress and baby's birth weight through this backdoor path of father's stress associated with confounder and confounder is also associated with baby's birth weight. For example, some family factor or genetic factor can be such a major confounder that's detected through this uh, procedure. So in this example, father stress has been called the negative control exposure or NCE. We use letter Z to denote negative control exposure. The formal definition of negative control exposure is that number one, it does not causally affect the outcome. And number two, for it to have some uh, information to uncover some the hidden bias due to a major confounder, it has to be associated with the major confounder U after you condition on the treatment. So alternatively, you can think of it as if I condition on the unmeasured confounder and treatment, then it's impossible for the, the NCE to be associated with the outcome. And we use such idea to create tests for detecting unmeasured confounding. Now, here's another example. This is an example of looking at the effect of flu vaccine on mortality during flu season. In the past few decades, there have been a lot of studies that use insurance claims data, observational data, to study the flu vaccine effectiveness. And one particular stat such study focused on the elderly and estimated the effect of flu shot on mortality dur during winter, which is the flu season. And what they found is that there is 50% reduction in risk of all-cause mortality during winter, which is quite amazing or impossible. It's such an extreme effect. And that created some concern about unmeasured confounding. In particular, in the field of vaccine effectiveness, one such uh, commonly seen uh, concern is so-called healthy user bias. The idea is if you are someone like me who really care about my health, then you're going to take the flu shot every single year. And at the same time, you're going to try to make sure that you stay healthy behaviors, healthy diet, and you stay healthy. So now if we look at the vaccinated group and unvaccinated group, the vaccinated group contains more of people like me. So it is unfair to compare them to the unvaccinated group, which tend to be uh, less healthy. So that is the potential unmeasured confounding by the so-called health-seeking behavior. What this study team did was that they went back and reconducted the same analysis, but instead of looking at the effect of flu shot or mor on mortality during flu season, they looked at the effect of flu shot on mortality before the flu season. The idea is that the key uh, component for flu shot to be protective is through flu or flu virus. Before the flu season, there's not so much flu virus uh, going on. So it's impossible for flu shot to have any protective effect on mortality. 
what they found in that study was that, in fact, there's a even larger reduction in risk of mortality before flu season, which is very impossible. And that indicates there is truly some um, confounder that was uncontrolled, for example, confounding due to health seeking behavior. In this example, the mortality before flu season is called the negative control outcome. And we use letter W to denote negative control outcome. The formal definition of a negative control outcome variable NCO is that number one, the negative control outcome is not causally affected by the treatment. And also it has to be associated with you. So to summarize, there are two types of negative control variables. The first one is negative control exposure, which does not causally affect the outcome. The other is the negative control outcome, which is not causally affected by the treatment. And they both have to be somehow related to the unmeasured confounder in order to enable us to be able to detect bias due to such unmeasured confounder. So the graphs that I showed you are just some example of potential causal graphs that encode the negative control assumption. There are actually a bunch of the such uh, graphs. I won't be able to go into details, but I wanted to highlight that for the uh, negative control exposure, in fact, the instrumental variable is just a special case of negative control exposure. And in addition, for a invalid instrumental variable that violates the randomization assumption is also a valid negative control exposure, which means the negative control exposure is a more general concept and that means they're easier to find. So they're truly widely available. In particular, in the literature, there are a few fields that have been using the idea of negative control variables uh, for a long time. Once First such field is the air pollution study. In this type of study, we often have time series data where we measure the air pollutant over time and health outcome over time. And by using the idea that the future does not cause the past, uh, this type of study often use future exposure as negative control exposure and past outcome as negative control outcome. In addition, the negative control uh, variables have also been used in genetic research to detect batch effect and control for batch effect, as well as in drug vaccine effectiveness, like we said about the flu vaccine. So I might not have time to go into details for this, um, but I just wanted to highlight that there have been a few gaps that we found in terms of application we have found about 130 studies that utilized negative control variable in their study. However, most of the study just use negative control variable to detect bias. There have not been much study that's, work, that's working on going beyond bias detection and looking at how can we use negative control variables to reduce and correct for a measured confounding bias. In addition, in terms of methodology, the methods that developed, which is listed in the table here, mainly rely, many of the methods rely on strong assumptions about the distribution of the data that we observe. The one I wanted to highlight is the seminal work by Dr. Wang Miao, who will give his talk in a bit. He, he and Eric, they developed a non parametric identification of the causal effect using a pair of negative control variables, one NCE and one NCO. And it's non-parametric in the sense that it doesn't rely on any distributional assumptions. So um, in the next few slides, I just wanted to spend some time to give you some intuition on how do we go beyond bias detection and think about how to use negative control variables to remove confounding bias. So here's the idea. Let's go back to the example of studying effect of flu shot on mortality and with health seeking behavior as the unmeasured confounder. If we think about, suppose we did, did not measure health seeking behavior at you, but we naively regress mortality on flu shot, then the association that we get to measure is consists of two components. One is the true causal effect, which is through this direct path, and we're gonna call it alpha AY. The other is the indirect, called indirect pathway through the backdoor path due to unmeasured confounding. And so the unmeasured confounding bias is essentially a product of the UA association and UY association, which is equal to gamma UA times beta UY. The 
coefficient of treatment is the sum of gamma UA times beta UI plus the true effect. And our goal is to, in order to identify the true causal effect, it comes down to identifying this amount of bias. If we can recover this amount of bias, then we can identify the causal effect. The idea in using, for example, a negative control outcome is that suppose I can measure something that's also mortality, but it's mortality before flu season, then I can look at, I know that flu shot does not have a direct, direct e effect on mortality before flu season. So any association I observe between A and W must be from this indirect pathway. And the, the amount is gamma UA times beta UW. So if I could assume that the two blue arrows have the same strengths of association, then I solve the problem. I recover exactly the amount of confounding bias. This is just a toy example based on some linear structural equation models, but the intuition behind the non-parametric identification is essentially this idea. So in this case, if you have a negative control outcome at hand, you can regress the outcome on treatment and also regress the negative control outcome on treatment. Then the treatment, the, cause, the true causal effect is essentially the difference between the two treatment effects. This and the special case of this idea is the difference in difference method. And there have been a lot of um, methods developed surrounding this idea. So this is the first stream. The second stream involves using a negative control exposure. And the idea is also similar. Again, we want to identify the confounding bias, which is again, a product of gamma UA and beta UY. But we measured further stress. And we know that the association between Z and Y is due to the, back to the hidden pathway. And that means if the two red arrows are of the same strength, then we can also recover the amount of unmeasured confounding bias indirectly through looking at the association between father stress and baby's birth weight. So in this case, when you have a anti control exposure at hand, you can regress the outcome on both the primary treatment and also the negative control exposure. Then the treatment effect, the true causal effect is the difference in the coefficients of A and Z. A special case of this idea is in air pollution study where we adjust for both the current air pollution level and future air pollution level. However, in the literature, the main focus was to use this idea to reduce bias. But here we're showing you the method to remove bias, which is in instead of doing the adjustment, simply take the difference of the coefficients. Now, what if the blues are not equal and the reds are also not equal? In this case, if I want to use the association between A and W to recover the um, measure confounding bias, that it will be gamma UA times beta UW. It, it only roughly recover the confounding bias and it's, it differed by a multiplicative scale. And in this scale, which is the ratio between beta UY and beta UW, either of those two coefficients are identifiable because we don't observe the confounder, the unmeasured confounder U. However, it turns out that the ratio is identifiable. And the way we identify the ratio is through a so-called double negative design, double negative control design, where we use both a negative control exposure and a negative control outcome. So the idea is that we're going to, we want to adjust for the association between A and negative control outcome. And we're going, going to use the negative control exposure to adjust for this ratio. And it turns out that the ZY association and the ZW association, their ratio exactly recovers this scale, the ratio between beta UY and beta UW. So we can directly use this scale to recover the, uh, combined with the AW association to recover the confounding bias. Now, a little bit more on the double negative control. Uh, we found that you can use a simple two-stage least square procedure to estimate the causal effect. In the first stage, we regress the negative control outcome on treatment and Z. And then we just take the fitted value of W and think of it as a proxy of U, as if we have measured some U. Then we're going to do the regular uh, regression. We're assuming, almost pretending that we have measured U, but instead of measuring U, we use U W hat 
as a proxy of you. So in the second stage, we will regress the outcome on treatment and also W hat. In this case, the coefficient of the treatment will be the measure confounding adjusted uh, treatment effect. Um, that concludes my uh, talk. And uh, I welcome uh, questions in after one's talk. So I'm going to turn, turn it back to Dr. Wang Miao. Great. Hi. That's great. So uh, that, th thanks for a great talk. And just to remind people, you can put questions into the Q&A um, chat box, put the questions in there while the talks are going on. Uh, and uh, so thanks for a great talk. And I will now um, pass over to uh, Wang Miao, who will um, take us through some um, even more difficult bits. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, and I think um, Dr. Xu has already established the foundations for nature control. Uh, I will just uh, move to the extensions and uh, connection. Uh, yeah, the first is a uh, connection with uh, IV uh, instrument variable. Uh, as, um, I think uh, many of the audience may be familiar with uh, instrument variables on Mendelian randomization, but here I will just uh, uh, repeat the uh, definition of instrument variable. We need these uh, three assumptions for a value instrument and variable, uh, but these assumptions are not uh, sufficient for an application of uh, causal effect. And uh, in general, we need uh, some other uh, assumptions uh, well, mostly uh, one of the assumptions is that a linear outcome model where uh, gamma one encodes the causal effect of X on Y and the U is a, an observed confounder, but the interaction of X and the U is not allowed in the uh, outcome model. Uh, this is uh, often the setting in modeling randomization where Z is a, a SNP or gene invariance and serve as a instrument variable, and the X, the Y are some uh, phenotype exposure or phenotype outcome. Uh, a common uh, estimation method is using uh, the IV estimator, uh, which is also known as the water estimator, which is a ratio of these two uh, covariance. And in fact, this estimator is uh, uh, numerically equivalent to a two-stage least square estimator. In the first step, uh, we regress the exposure X to the uh, instrument variable Z and obtain a, a prediction or estimate of the exposure X hat. And in the second step, we substitute the, the true uh, exposure with the estimated exposure X hat and reg regress Y on X hat to obtain the uh, IV estimate or two CG least square estimator gamma one hat. Uh, this is the case when we have a valid uh, IV that satisfies the, all these three assumptions and the outcome model is correctly specified. Uh, but the one uh, situation often encountered in uh, modeling memorization is that uh, the, we have an invalid IV that uh, IV may be correlated with the uh, confounder. For example, in a recent paper by uh, George and uh, collaborators, they consider uh, where uh, a man of the confounder is the population stratification. Yeah, in this case, uh, the IV estimate of 2C least square estimate is no longer consistent and maybe very misleading. However, they uh, observe that uh, the negative control uh, method or the negative control outcome can be used to resolve this uh, issue. Uh, so here is uh, just uh, the uh, graph that she already showed that we have an exposure, negative control exposure Z, as well as a negative control outcome W. And uh, uh, we have these uh, conditional independences that uh, uh, characterize these uh, negative controls. And these uh, assumptions, we have a negative control estimator for the color effect of X on Y, which is similar to the two uh, 
to the IV estimator, but uh, here we have more covariance now. Uh, in fact, we can show that this estimator is uh, equivalent to some uh, two-stage least square. It's a modified two-stage least square. Here in the first step, we regress uh, W on X and Z. W is the negative control outcome. And uh, uh, to obtain the uh, W hat uh, prediction of W. And then in the second step, we use a uh, regress Y on X and W hat and obtain the negative control estimator uh, gamma one hat. Uh, this estimator, this negative control estimator uh, has a good property. Uh, it, it is doubly robust in the sense that it is consistent if either uh, the outcome, the negative control outcome model is linear in U, or the negative control exposure is a valid IV. Yeah, that is, you uh, can independent of the confounder U. So in this sense, uh, if we can correctly specify the uh, confounding model on the negative control outcome, or we have a valid IV, we can cor correctly estimate the uh, causal effect. So in situations where the uh, instrument variable is invalid, that is, it may be correlated with the confounder, uh, if we can use a good or a suitable negative control outcome, we can also recover the color effect of interest and thus resolve the invalid IV problem. Another feature for the negative control uh, method is that we can also account for the interaction of X and U interaction of the treatment and the confounder by including uh, interactions XW in the two-stage least square. But however, uh, the, the conventional IV setting, the conventional IV method cannot include such interactions. Uh, we always need such a additive model or linear model. We do not allow the interaction of X and U in the uh, IV method. So in this sense, uh, the negative control method can be viewed as a generalization or extension of the conventional IV method. Uh, another uh, problem is that uh, the negative control outcome may be may not be valid. That it, it may be also uh, affected by the exposure x. That is, we have a direct arrow from x to w in this graph. Uh, Intuitively, we can uh, also use the negative control method by first subtract the effect of X on W, and then use the uh, remaining part as the negative control outcome. Right, yeah, that, that is how it works. Uh, so uh, in the first line, uh, the first equality is the negative control outcome case, uh, where uh, it shows how we can recover the cause effect of X on Y by using a valid negative control outcome. Uh, it, is, it is the same as she already uh, showed, uh, but here the notation is just a, a little more complicated. Uh, as a comparison, if we have a positive net control outcome, that is uh, W is also affected by the uh, exposure X. In this case, we just need to first subject the, uh, the true call effect of X on W from uh, the crude uh, estimation. Uh, but how, how is this uh, useful? So if you are in practice, if we want to know the effect of X on Y, we have to first know the effect of X on W. Uh, this may be a very strong assumption, uh, but I think it is most useful when we are doing uh, sensitivity analysis. Uh, here is an example. Uh, follow from George's paper. Uh, in, this, in this setting, we consider the effect of uh, minus smoking on uh, offspring health outcomes like birth weight and uh, later life uh, outcome body uh, mass index. Uh, of course, uh, we have a method confounding here and we use an active control exposure that is paternal smoking Z. Uh, one may, uh, yeah, one may ask that uh, minor smoking may have effects on both of these two outcomes. 
you know, how can we recover or uh, we recover the cause effect of X on Y and W? Uh, here is the result, uh, the summary results from uh, George's paper. Uh, because uh, we do not have the individual level data, we just use the summary uh, data. Uh, then, uh, following uh, from this equality, we obtain the relationship of uh, the effect of x on y and the, and the effect of x on w, where y is the birth weight and the w is the later life uh, body mass index, like uh, at the uh, age uh, at six or seven years old. We have this uh, equality. Uh, then we, then from this uh, equality, we can conclude that uh, minor smoking is likely to have a, a negative effect on birth weight, because if we want uh, uh, the average cause effect of x on y to be positive, we must have that the effect of x on w be. Uh, smaller than minus 1.5 uh, kilogram per uh, meter. That, that is, if uh, ACEXY is uh, positive, then ACEXW is a very uh, large negative effect. But from uh, practice or from some studies, that uh, minus smoking is likely to have a uh, to increase body uh, mass index, not decrease mass index. So uh, as a sensitivity analysis method, we may conclude that the uh, ma minor smoking is, is likely to have a negative effect on birth weight. So in this sense, the uh, positive control outcome uh, is most useful when we are doing sensitivity analysis. Another relationship is uh, connection to the uh, RUV in statistical genetics, where RUV is uh, for removing unwanted variation. Uh, in statistical genetics, people are interested in the relationship between uh, gene expressions and some uh, genotype or uh, some uh, exposures. Uh, there are some uh, method of confounding in. Uh, this setting due to batch effect. For example, the samples are handled in a different lab by different people or at a different time. So the batch effect may introduce the method confounding in this case. So how uh, how do people uh, handle the method confounding here? Uh, there is uh, some method called RUV. Uh, but here I just show how negative control method can be used in this setting. So suppose we are interested in effect or, uh, or the relationship between some exposure X and some gene expressions, G1 here. But we, uh, we also have other uh, genes like G2 and G3. And we know that G2 and G3 are not causally related to the exposure X. Such genes are uh, re available in many of these studies like uh, control genes like uh, housekeeping genes. Uh, housekeeping genes are genes that uh, only for basic uh, functional of the body, uh, it is usually not related to the uh, exposure or risk factor. So in this case, these control genes can be used as negative control, negative control exposures and outcomes, and thus can be used to recover the uh, causal effect of interest. So in the last part, I will talk about the uh, relationship between negative control and the proximal inference. So, uh, I think uh, the, the most, uh, one of the most commonly used assumptions in color inference or observational studies is that the exchangeability assumption or ignorability assumption uh, that says the observed covariates uh, can account for all uh, confounding uh, in the observational study. However, uh, there are skepticism that uh, the queries are only made with uh, error. They are not very accurate or exact uh, the uh, true confounder. In this case, we, uh, we treat the, the method query as best uh, proxies of the true underlying confounder. Actually, there is a paper on American 
economic reviews that encourages people to use uh, too cheap and noisy methods than one expensive one, the accurate one. This is a paper on uh, AER. Uh, so uh, to some sense, uh, all measured queries are, uh, are measured with errors. So in this case, how can, can we make in, call inference in uh, observational studies? Uh, recently, uh, we proposed a proximal causal learning framework, which uh, explicitly acknowledges covariant measures are uh, imperfect proxies of the confounders, uh, but it en enables one uh, way to potentially learn the causal effects in settings where exchangeability does not hold based on the uh, measured covariance. The, uh, let's uh, first uh, consider the uh, exchangeability settings. So here are some graphs where exchangeability uh, holds, where L is observed covariance, A and Y are the treatment and outcome of interest. In the first case, L captures all the confounder. And in the second case, L captures the confounder, uh, the treatment confounder. It uh, share a common cause with the uh, outcome, but it does not directly relate to the outcome. In the third setting, L captures all the outcome confounders. And in the last case, uh, we uh, partition L into three cases, uh, three parts, Z, X, and W. And uh, Z captures the treatment confounders, W captures outcome confounders, and X captures uh, the other confounders. So these are the uh, four cases uh, that uh, often encountered in practice where exchangeability holds. However, in some uh, situations, exchangeability may uh, fail. Uh, I, I just uh, skip this slide. You, for example, when the treatment induced and the outcome induced confounders have a common and man the confounder, in this case, the exchangeability does not hold. But the proximal inference uh, framework generalizes the exchangeability assumption and can still uh, consistently estimate the cause effect of X on, of A on Y in this setting, even the exchangeability does not hold. So uh, the graph here can be uh, encoded in this uh, new graph, where we uh, unify all the confounders by a vector u, and we uh, have uh, two proxies, z and w, where z is now called a treatment-induced uh, uh, confounder proxy, and w is called an outcome-induced confounder proxy. Uh, in this case, z and w are similar to the negative control exposures we already introduced. They behave like a negative control exposure and the W behaves like a negative control outcome. And then we can apply the negative control method to do co uh, proximal cause inference and recover the cause effect of A on Y. Uh, as she already introduced uh, many of the uh, graphs that uh, uh, negative controls hold, and similarly, there are, uh, simil there are many other graphs that we, uh, the proximal inference uh, is valid. Uh, here I just uh, uh, show uh, two graphs here. In the first graph, Z and W are correlated with A and Y. And then in the second graph, it may not be correlated with A and Y, but it is required to be correlated with the confounder U. And then we uh, formally have this uh, conditional independence that characterizes the exclusion restrictions required for negative controls. And then we can apply the negative control uh, methods to do proximal inference. And uh, uh, these two papers by my co authors, uh, Yifan Chui and uh, Eric Chang Chang, recently uh, addressed this uh, problem and established the proximal inference framework. An interesting uh, thing is that uh, they, they established a proximal G formula. Uh, here is a G formula we often use in observational studies where exchangeability holds. Suppose the exchangeability holds for covariance X and W, then how we 
then we uh, recover the potential outcome mean by this formula, which is known as the uh, G formula. We first compute the color effect of A and Y within uh, each level of X and W, and then we average all the levels to obtain the uh, average uh, color effect or average potential outcome mean. And in contrast, uh, the proximal G formula uh, is similar, but the first, for the first step, we do not compute the, uh, the, the, uh, the average color effect within each level of the correct. We compute the, we solve this, uh, in, this uh, equation for H, and then in the second step, we average uh, H on all levels X and W. In a special case that uh, X and W uh, suffices for exchangeability, these two formulas are equivalent. So in this sense, the uh, negative control or proximal inference is the generalization of the uh, conventional G formula. Uh, in the last, here is the uh, application of the proximal uh, inference. I will just uh, briefly uh, show this. Uh, this is a, a reanalysis re of the support study where uh, the color effect of RHC on uh, survival time is of interest. Uh, this study includes uh, 73 queries and uh, uh, including demographics and uh, psychological uh, 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 status and uh, functional status. Uh, the outcome is the number of days between admission and death or sensing and 30 days if the uh, patient is not dead. Uh, here uh, we 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 use uh, two uh, uh, we 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 use uh, the negative we specify proxy proxy allocations z uh, equals uh, parallel one and parallel two one and uh, uh, the other two as a uh, uh, outcome induced uh, proxy uh, outcome induced uh, confounded proxy. And for estimation, it is similar to the negative control setting. We apply two stage list square and some routing on software such as RV Red can be used to uh, solve the two stage list square problem. Uh, and then the, this table shows the uh, results. And uh, finally, the uh, estimated code effect of RHC on uh, survival time is minus 1.8. This is uh, slightly uh, larger than results obtained in the literature, uh, which shows that the RHC is likely to have a negative effect on survival time. So uh, here your uh, summary, uh, we show uh, that negative controls and the confounded proxies can be used to adjust for confounding bias. And a two-state least square and the routine soft uh, variable can be uh, easily implemented and the negative controls can be used to resolve uh, invalid IV, uh, RUV uh, problems. And uh, uh, the, these methods are convenient to use uh, uh, and uh, 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 convenience of analysis with the summary data and the data integration because uh, uh, two stage list square uh, can be done uh, with uh, two sample and uh, uh, summary data, right? So uh, negative control is a modified uh, two-stage data square method, and uh, uh, it can also accommodate with summary data and uh, uh, data integration. So one last uh, question is that uh, for negative control, we still require some precise knowledge of negative controls or proxies. We need to uh, allocate or specify negative controls and proxies. But in practice, uh, one may not have such knowledge. So uh, what uh, can people do in this case? For example, in, in GWAS, we suppose we are interested in the relationship between many genes and some uh, phenotype. And we have a method confounding, but we do not have a, a, a valid specification of negative controls or proxy. And recently, uh, there's a paper, uh, a discussion paper on JAS that uh, proposed a, a deconfounder approach that uh, 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 attempt to estimate the color effect of multiple treatments on, out, on one outcome. Uh, but this method is shown to be flawed uh, by some authors. And recently we uh, 
have a paper address this issue where uh, when multiple treatments are of interest and the uh, method confounding uh, appears. Uh, this paper is now on ICANN. Uh, here I just uh, briefly introduced the results. So we assume a factor model or mixture model for the treatment. Uh, this is all, this is commonly used in uh, spill genetics where people assume a factor model for uh, genes. And uh, then we assume that if fewer than half of treatments are active, then we can identify the call effect of all treatments. Know that we do not know which uh, treatments are active. We just need that uh, few of the, uh, fewer than half of them are active. As a toy example, if the uh, treatments, if the genes act uh, follow the linear factor model and the outcome model is also linear and the uh, coefficient beta encoding the call effect, if beta, uh, if uh, fewer than half of beta are non-zero, then we can uh, identify beta without knowing which one are active. Uh, here is an application uh, that uh, using the uh, multiple treatments method. Uh, this is a well known uh, mouse obesity, obesity data, and we an analyze uh, 37 genes, uh, and uh, among them, 17 genes were previously shown to be uh, uh, active. And uh, uh, we use three methods. The, the last panel is the uh, audience released square, and the second panel is the uh, uh, method assumes that fewer than, or fewer than half are active. And then the first uh, panel is the uh, uh, conventional IV method yes, that use uh, SNPs as IVs. Uh, they the, these three methods show similar patterns, but uh, the first two methods find, have, some, have some new findings like uh, uh, GPLD1 and uh, RIX3 and the CCNL2. Uh, these are consistent with the previous studies in you know, genetics that these genes are uh, like to be, I like to uh, affect uh, the mouse uh, weight. Okay, uh, here's uh, uh, this is uh, all my talk. And uh, in the last, uh, I would like to briefly introduce my other work. Uh, I also work on data theory methods and uh, uh, previously I work on missing data and semi parametric and uh, uh, that's all my talk. Thank you. Great, right, thanks so much. So uh, I think if people have questions, they can raise their hands and um, <clears throat> spoken questions, they can raise their hands and uh, Marie can uh, un unmute you. Um, whilst we can, well, oh, here's one. Will, will the slides be available after the presentation? Uh, well, the, the, it's been recorded, so uh, you can watch you can uh, watch all the slides again. So that's the uh, answer to that. So the, the recording will uh, probably go on uh, online in a day or two. Marie will email, okay. email around. We, we, are, we're also happy to forward the slide if you want to send it to your. Um, sure. Okay, that that that'll be fantastic. Uh, so yeah, I'll, so maybe I'll ask a question whilst waiting for some hands to, uh, any hands to go up. Um, so so really really both really nice um, presentations. Uh, I mean perhaps I, I mean I'll just say as it was an example of, uh, of uh, one of my examples and uh, why I'd found I'd found the I I would find the results um, uh, uh, difficult to completely trust is of the maternal smoking in, in pregnancy. So you have maternal smoking in pregnancy and birth weight, and you, and you have the idea, you take paternal smoking as a um, negative control of sort of shared socioeconomic behavioral type factors that, 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 that um, um, the, the mother and the father will share and the smoking and the father will uh, index those in the same way as smoking the mother. And then with, and then, and so then you get birth, then you get birth weight of the offspring, and you you um, you know that that's a causal effect maternal smoking. So you sort of you using that as a positive control, you you see the sort of magnitude or effect of, of observational association you get with paternal smoking gives you a sort of index of confounding. Um, but then 
which is which is it, 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 that one follows. But then, if you're looking at, then you were looking at um, smoking and BMI in the child, maternal smoking during pregnancy and the BMI, BMI in the child. But well, in that situation, you know, you, you take the paternal smoking, and it would still mark certain things. But the mother. Uh, would very likely spend a lot more time um, with the child and will have greater influence on the child in that period than the father. So for the confounders acting uh, up to age seven on the child, it, it won't, it, there's, no, there's no reason to believe that it would work exactly the same to exactly the same quantitative degree um, and that, um, that the, you know, the, the, the confounded effect of the father smoking on, on um, on the child's weight at seven would, would scale to the magnitude of the confounded effect of the father's smoking on birth weight. So, yeah, so yeah, that, that, really that, seems a, yeah. That's, that seems a strong assumption, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. But did you make that assumption, uh, Wang? I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. So, so I, I think maybe there was a, some confusion about um, something that Shu presented, which was um, she first started by introducing this very strong assumption whereby you, you may extrapolate and say um, the UW uh, association is equal to the UY association or the Z, um, U association is equal to the, Z, A, uh, the UA association, um, which we, we sometimes refer to as equivariant confounding. Um, that's, those are really strong assumptions. We don't think they hold in general, except in cases where the, um, in, in, for instance, in difference in differences, where, where the negative control outcome is a pretreatment outcome. And so they, they live on the same scale. In general, they're just not on the same scale. So I didn't think you made, there was no scale uh, um, dependency assumption here. The, the whole point of most of these methods were to say those, those assumptions are unrealistic. Um, you need those assumptions if you, you only have one negative control, but if you're leveraging two negative control or one negative control and a positive control, you, you may relax those scale um, invariant assumption and, and account for the fact that those variables live in, on different scales completely, um, but, but still be able to correct your effect estimate. Right, yeah. But you, but, but you, you, you were using the, uh, okay, I, I thought you, were, you, you, you mentioned positive, I thought you were using the maternal effect on smoking on birth weight, you, you refer to that as a positive control, which I would see that as, but you're using that as a positive control. You're saying. Right, yeah. Mm. But in this case, uh, positive control is uh, used as a sensitivity analysis method. Yeah. And so okay. in this particular case, he, I think the conclusion was basically that um, the uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Wang, if I remember correctly, was that um, in order for the for, for there to be to to rule out a causal effect, you would require a really strong protective effect of 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 uh, so it's X W of maternal smoking on on um, BMI, data life BMI, and, yeah. and that just was incredible. Um, so right, it, was, yeah. it was more of a testing analysis to say that this, this observed effect would just not be, uh, could just not amount, account, amount from, from confounding bias. Right, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly the logical, uh, this sensitivity analysis. But, yeah, okay. But that depends, it does depend upon assumptions of the, uh, about the, uh, relative degree to which the, any of the, which the negative controls, uh, either exposures or outcomes, um, you know, are influenced in the same way by the by these supposed or measured confounders. Um, no, um, so, so so I think maybe one. Do you can you do you have the linear models examples? Um, or, or maybe it was Shu who had uh, the linear yeah, I models. Can, yeah. Because uh, I, I think this is a really good question. No, no, not not this one. Just a linear system of equations. Um, okay, I, I think uh, she has right. Should I put yeah? Should I pull up the paper or the slides? Just the just the slides. I I, okay. I, I think the slides might do it. Yeah. Um, 
And, and I think this is a really good question, George. And, and this really goes at the really what our goal here was really to do away with these scale dependence yeah. assumptions. Um, so, um, so here, thank you. Um, so the, the, the point here was that um, in the prior slides, she was saying that like methods like such as difference and differences essentially assume, oh, can you go back to the slide that you had? Okay, methods like difference and differences would, would typically use uh, the negative control outcome W would be the pre exposure outcome, right? The baseline measurement of the outcome. And so W and Y would be, live on the same scale. And the usual assumption essentially embedded in difference of differences is that beta UY is equal to beta UW. Yeah. That because they live on the same scale. And, and the point here is that we wanted to do away with that. And so what we, what we do is we, we then uh, uh, incorporate a negative control exposure and, and with the next Z, and we, we, we also do not want to assume that the association of Z with U, gamma UZ, is equal to the association of U with A, gamma UA. Now, if you believe that the world is linear, it turns out you don't need those, 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 those um, you, you only need to, to identify, to be able to identify the ratio of these associations. So for instance, you only need to identify the ratio of beta UI to beta U W, and uh, uh, what what we show is that you can actually identify that ratio, even though you may not be able to identify the actual magnitude of the two, and you don't need to assume that that ratio is one. And so the, right. the formula to do so is the one that's given at, at the bottom of the page, is literally taking the the association to Z and Y and divided by the association to Z and W, and that turns out to recover that ratio. And once you have that ratio, essentially you can rescale. You can, right, you can rescale the outcome, for instance, to, so that now they're back at the same scale. So it's, it's essentially saying that if you have a negative control exposure and negative control yeah. outcome, you can correct for the fact that they, they, they live on different scales than your exposure and the outcome. And of course, this, this is all predicated by an assumption that the world is linear. Yeah. Um, and then we have generalization that allow for it to be nonlinear. But this, the intuition it really is, 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 is in here. Um, Shu and Wang, I don't know if you have a, a more intuitive way of explaining it. I'm also mindful that we're, we're past time. Um, okay, so, well, oh, well I'll, 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 I'll say, because there haven't been, oh, there's some more. Uh, oh no, there's no, there's no more. Oh yeah, sorry. No, they don't appear to be. Uh, I, I don't think there's any, uh, no, there's no questions. Uh, in the Q&A that I can see. And I don't think anyone's raised hands. So we'll say that um, if there's no, if people don't have uh, uh, questions, uh, a few of us are just staying on to have a, a chat uh, um, now. So, um, uh, and so um, you, you, uh, anyone who's particularly interested in this area is welcome to stay on for a general chat, uh, general discussion, but um, um, it's, it's past time and so, we should say that the actual um, seminar is over. Um, so, uh, so um, yeah, the, uh, uh, just people who want to, who have a particular interest in this area might want to uh, stay. Uh, and um, uh, uh, Jim Pamani has uh, emailed to say that uh, he's got to go. So he's going to email you some questions if that's okay. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah, of so course. So he'll 